Mediation. This is Fenton Mediation, and I'm your host, Greg Fenton. Each week, we explore topics and ideas related to the experience of people with conflict and look to promote the profession of conflict resolvers. We are available to connect with at FentonMediation at gmail.com and 647-227-4734. Check out the Facebook page for Mediation Station and the group, also under the same name, to ask to become a member. Also visit YouTube channel Fenton Mediation to see videos of past shows. Listen to podcasts of Mediation Station on soundcloud.com or Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts. The conversation today is called Mediation and Arbitration or Med Arb. What's the point? With me will be Laura Tarcia and Marty Klein. We'll connect with both of them very soon. We continue to do the program live each Sunday night from 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time through Zoom due to COVID-19 measures. We will engage in conversation with everyone attending, able to listen and watch the conversation. Microphones and webcams will be closed. And if anyone wants to contribute anything, there are two options. One is to see the chat icon as a bubble at the bottom center of your screen for you to click to then type in a comment or question and click to send. Or you can click on the reactions icon that is also on the bottom center of your screen for us to see. Click on the hand icon for us to then open up your mic for you to speak and share your information or comment or question and then we will close your mic afterward. The show is being recorded for both video and audio purposes that will be uploaded once edited for public access on SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts to listen to once the shows are available. So today we are talking with Laura Tarcia and Marty Klein. They're on your visuals now. And we're talking about mediation and arbitration or med arb. What's the point? Did you do a dance there, Laura? We both did. It was, it was quasi-synchronized. Quasi you guys choreographed that before? <laughs> yeah. We rehearsed quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I see you've been it's still really... Little work. <laughs> it's still a little work. Still wasn't. <laughs> and, and how would you identify the, who's responsible for that not working? Definitely Marty. Yeah, that's what I thought you'd say. How are you doing, Marty? I'm doing well. I'm, uh, I'm warm. I'm, uh, it's been a uh, <clears throat> real feel of 45 degrees every day this week wow. where I'm located and uh, uh, I miss the cold. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? So when it. we say, let's clarify 45 degrees, we're do, we are talking about Celsius, not yeah, Fahrenheit. Yeah, Celsius. Wow. Yeah. So you got the air conditioner on in your place? Uh, I have an air conditioner in this, my office here. And uh, no, I don't actually. And the air conditioner here is set at 27 degrees which is quite high, but it, it's, a, it's a freezing compared to the rest of the house. The electricity here is a fortune. So we really have to watch the air so we don't put it on. And uh, I'm, I'm wet most of the time. I'm soaking like it's, uh, it's a, just a way of life down here. What can I say? For those, those wondering, I'm off the coast of Honduras, the mainland of Honduras about 40 kilometers on a little island called Roatan. It's a volcanic island. It's quite unique, uh, very uh, jungle-like, uh, beautiful beaches, and uh, very rugged terrain, and um, very different from the mainland of Honduras. And the two hurricanes that came through Honduras that really did a lot of devastation didn't come to this island it somehow it just misses the island all the time we did have tropical storms but so i've been down here now since november of 2020 and i'm trying to get back to toronto actually to be honest with you i mean uh, it's kind of difficult right now so you're not permanently uh, shifting yourself to be located down in, in the honduras area well I, I am and i'm not i mean i've still got to get back you know just for immigration purposes and health wise and all that sort of stuff. Oh, your six month period, right? So your health yeah, coverage I'm doesn't lapse. 
Oh yeah, I'm over the six right now, but but I've been doing mediations down here, and I'm uh, I'm on a fiber optic line right now, and my connections are amazing, so it's 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 good. And and the other thing I would ask is that uh, make sure that that volcano that volcano is not active. Just saying. Oh yeah, no, I haven't seen the crater. I don't, I think it's many years, many 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 years. It's it's not spewing out any uh, steam or lava, right? No, no. No, no. Yes. <laughs> okay, that's cool. So what is a word that uh, best describes the type of person you each identify as? One word. Can you put it in one word? One word. Um, yeah. I would say open for myself. <laughs> okay. Mr. Klein? Peacemaker. At all costs. That's I, a compound word, right? It's because almost like two words there. He, no, I don't know. It could be one. Yeah, well, that's why I'm saying a compound word rather to, to two separate words. Yeah. I get myself into a lot of trouble. Peacemakers suffer, believe me. You may know that from personal experience. You get involved in, in people's lives, and uh, I get way too involved in people's lives, clients, third parties, not knowing them. And boy, it comes back to bite you. How do, you, how do you try to deal with the, uh, the feelings, the emotions, the lived experiences of people when they project that kind of energy onto you? I, I try to tell them that there's, an, uh, there's another day tomorrow. I, I joke a lot with them, as Laura knows. Uh, and uh, I try to you know, allow them to not take life so seriously. Like, you're going to get through it. Like, it's going to happen. I mean, you're... You know, you're not dying tomorrow and that you know of, at least at this point. And uh, there are things that happen. I know as I've been practicing law for over 35 years, and the people who have come through my office who have been so devastated by separation, their lives, as we get into the case, change dramatically because they needed that separation. And, you know, that's really the reward you know, in all of this is, is seeing people's lives change for the better. It doesn't always happen, but uh, even more so with, uh, with family dispute resolution, no question. Laura, you want to share anything? Um, I used to take emotions home with me. I still do. Um, but I'm, I'm almost as close to what Marty is relaying, the mindset that it, it will get done. It will move through. Um, and I just, I, I think I do a lot of debriefing now. So I've, I've been, I've been using a lot of debriefing with my, uh, my colleagues or my friends sometimes. And just as long as I have a safe space, then I feel that I can uh, at least, uh, go through myself, um, mm -hmm. some, you know, some of the heavy emotions uh, and talk through, because there are some cases that are, um, you know, they do make me feel sometimes morally um, just uh, um, kind of wrong, <laughs> even to take a case. <laughs> so, uh, or to mediate or to be neutral or to be not neutral, to be, to, to continue to, uh, to be part of uh, both, uh, both um, uh, parents uh, sort of journey in, in the mediation. So I, I, I struggle. However, I try to find ways to uh, either uh, talk it through or, um, um, or, you know, have a, have a, have a colleague or a debrief or things like that. I would suspect that it would have been different for you to process both of you, your energy of the experiences of people's trauma or crisis before COVID because you may have been physically at an uh, external place from where you're currently at and you transition to, because you're one and the same, aren't you both, in where you're residing, living daily, and also functioning your professional worlds. You're not having a separate space that you can go to the office, leave all that at the office, and then go home and have a new environment. Well, I, I think even the nature of the work, even if we had an office, and I'll speak for Marty too, even if, That's good. <laughs> even if we have an office, um, I don't think we could have left that at the office. Um, I, I, I'm not sure. It's just the nature of the work itself. Uh, you know, I remember going to the office, physical separation was not really 
um, was not really separating or allowing me to separate the emotions much. When I was coming home, I was pretty much still, uh, um, still carrying it with me. So. And, and you, Mar Marty? Oh yeah, well, I, so I've, I've had a home office uh, before I moved here. I had a very professional looking office. I mean, I've had downtown lawyers come or paying, you know, thousands upon thousands of dollars a month rent and they come into my home. I had a separate entrance and it was done very well and I made sure it was going to be done really well. And they were so impressed. Uh, many of them said, gee, you know, uh, what, what am I paying all this rent for when I can do this? So it, it's, uh, it's interesting. Um, you know, I was going to say that this COVID thing is just like insane. I mean, it's just like, it's changed. The, I mean, we all know it's changed the world, but you know, when I speak to people and even if it's a mediation or whatever, and you stop, stop a moment and you look at them and you say, isn't this unbelievable what's happening to us? Even though they've said it many, 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 many times, it's always a topic of conversation with pretty well everyone, but they stop for a minute and they said, it's like, oh my God, you know what? You're right. It's changed, you know? So all of our ways, the courts, um, the way kids are going to school, I mean, life has changed dramatically. It's like almost the industrial revolution. It's incredible if you think about it, if you look through history and the change that's happened, it's, it's just unbelievable how we communicate with one another, how we deal with one another. It's, uh, it's, it's changed incredibly. So to answer your question specifically, um, I've been, so I, I've been a lawyer, family law lawyer for over 35 years. And I'll tell you, I can never, I, I, I just never learned how to cut, shut off the emotions. I just, I can't do it. I'm, I'm a total loser when it comes to that. Well, I, you know, I'm not going to make judgment about you. At the same time, I'm going to say, why would you want to shut off the emotions? Preserve, preservation, self-preservation. Well, you're a human being, though. You're affected. We all go through, you know, interacting with people, and uh, we're not the machines. Right. No, I agree. And I, you know, I also often thought, you know, at one point I had a law firm of six, six of us, and I often thought of getting a social worker in uh, on once or every two weeks just to talk through cases, just, you know, unidentified information, just to let some of the rocks off so to speak because uh you know you build up all this tension and everything else and then you could end up taking it home and then taking it out on your kids and your family and who's or and yourself so um it's 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 hard it's it's very difficult being in family law dealing with human relations whether it's labor law even employment law um it's it's hard it's it's very difficult and and uh if you have any kind of a heart uh, as a human being, um, and some lawyers and some mediators don't necessarily pass that litmus test, um, you'll be surprised to, um, I, I mean, I'm surprised when I meet those people, I almost envy them, but at the same time, I don't think that's what clients really want. I mean, the clients do really want to have people who care and can empathize in some way or sympathize. So as you said, Marty, you've been a practicing lawyer for at least 35 years. Mm -hmm. When did you transition into mediation stuff? So, oh, probably about, I mean, I've always been mediative. I've always been collaborative, even though I'm in the collaborative process. Um, probably about eight years ago. Mm -hmm and uh, got involved in uh, Conrad Grable uh, with, you know, uh, Barb Landau and her former, well, her husband now. University just, of Waterloo. Yeah, what, University of Waterloo and uh, did my advanced certificate in arbitration. And, uh, it was something that I really wanted to do was before the fad happened. And now I say fad because there's so many people doing mediation now uh, litigate heavy, heavy litigators, and it's just another way of making money. I mean, I, I'm not blaming them per se, but uh, I was driven into mediation because I saw what the system was doing to them, and uh, it wasn't 
the best way. It just really wasn't the best way to try to resolve. Not to say that arbitration was any better, to be honest with you. Okay. So let's, let's each of you share your perspective of what mediation is to you. Start with you, Flora. What's mediation mean to you? What, what is it about? It's an option to get to a settlement. Hopefully that it's the, the, the path to the, the least destructive path to, to hopefully get to some form of a, um, of a resolution. So that's, that's sort of what mediation represents to me. And it's in, you know, I've, I've shared this plenty with you too. You also represent, for me, it's hope. For me, there's a lot of hope in mediation. Um, and for the, for the parents uh, in a separation, for the family as a whole, uh, for the community at large. So it is, it is a hopeful process. Uh, and and it, the, the path to least destruction, really, that's how I see it. I'm not sure how, Marty, how you're looking at it. Well, you know, having gone through um, two uh, divorces myself, uh, I have uh, firsthand experience in uh, resolving matters uh, and trying to get re matters resolved. Fortunately, we were rational enough to be able to work through things in, in a rational manner and come to a, a, a resolution. So by uh, the way, did you hire a lawyer to represent you in that process? Um, the first one, my associate did the separation agreement, so and we so I did. And the second one, we're talking about divorces here. First divorce, second divorce. Just to clarify, I did my own divorce. I mean, the, the paperwork on the divorce that wasn't a, a big deal. Uh, it's like a driver's license, really. I mean, it was the separation agreement. But the second one we did, we had a we entered we did enter into mediation. We didn't do MEDAR, but we did mediation and. And we resolved it. And uh, I didn't have a lawyer, actually. No, I didn't. I didn't. At that point, I was just getting advice on the side. So you acted as a self-represented. I mean, you yeah. empowered yourself because you already you had knowledge about yeah. the legal context and the process. And the you took that. One, the second one was done by, and you probably know her, Mary Satterfield, who's now deceased. She, Mary, was a, a long-standing mediator. And, and with collaborative law. And, uh, but uh, it was, um, I actually got my accountant involved because my, there was an accounting thing and she liked my accounting, my former spouse. She liked the accountant, so that was really good. But, you know, having said all of that, I think people come to you and you, you, they, you have to realize it's over. And when you come to that realization it's over, how do we pick up the pieces and get the, the pieces together so that we can salvage this? Let's stop the broken, uh, the, the broken telephone you know my lawyer calls me my lawyer then relates hopefully my feelings or my position to the other side the other side goes back to his client at least you're all there together you know I was thinking that I was just going to mention Laura and I are meet in the midst of uh, we're just starting a, co a mediation with a couple and uh, we interviewed him first and uh, you know I walked out of there I thought well this other person on the other side, boy, oh boy, the, the, it's going to be, what a nasty person, you know? And then when we met the next person, interviewed the next person, it, I felt totally different. I said, wow, there's a totally different story here. That's what I like about mediation because you get both sides of the story and you can see what's going on and you can then have an insight to know how to deal with it. Um, uh, that's the exciting thing about mediation. Um, well, that can be, though you just mentioned what I really is a trap for many of us, especially the inexperienced or newer person. When you start out, you're, you know, you're, you're saying, okay, you have two steps. You meet individually, and then you have joint sessions. Right. And the idea is that when you meet individually with someone, you're getting their perspective, you're building a rapport, you're hopefully creating a template of trust with you and the process. And then you get that story and you say, wow, that's so profound. And then you transition it to say, that other person must be such a jerk based yeah. on what they've told me. Right. And then you form some kind of internal bias, the potential when you go into your individual meeting with the other person. 
and there's a risk that you might project or communicate that bias when we know we're talking about being quote neutral and impartial. But you know, I've, I've had that all the time when I was a small claims court judge. I was a small claims court judge for 17 years. And, uh, you know, I'd hear the plaintiff's case and I just wanted to close down court and say, you know what, I don't want really to hear from the defendant. Like this defendant's like libel and they're out to lunch. Thank you very much. But I obviously that's not the way to do it. You have to be open minded. But, you know, we're human and you hear a story and you sympathize, etc. But then when you hear the fortunately, you hear the other side and you can take a different perspective. So, yeah, I mean, it's uh, you never know till, you know, until, you know, as they say, the fat lady sings, you know, till the end of the day and until and you get the whole picture. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We, you know, a major skill is we have to learn to compartmentalize. We have mm -hmm. to take in context and put it in a space within us. And it, hopefully that's a non-judgmental space to put it there and then open ourselves up to hearing another perspective, again, with non-judgment, because then we can transition the possibility of projecting from the second party their story onto the other one in a judgmental way. So we, you know, we navigate these, I think I encourage people to, create this whole template of compartmentalizing, putting it in perspective. And then you open yourself up to the collective and hope that you can navigate that in a uh, best practice way. So how about we shift from the concept of mediation to the concept and approach of arbitration? What is that to each of you? Start with you, Laura. I'll start with Marty. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> she doesn't like arbitration. You know, it's funny. If you, if, I always tell people, if you have 10 issues, and you resolve eight, you do an agreement, that's done. But there are two issues that you can't resolve. So what do you do at that point? Do you, if you're in mediation, you could still sign just mediation. You could sign an agreement and then go off to court uh, um, to resolve the two other issues. Um, in mediation arbitration, uh, the mediator becomes the arbitrator. They waive, the and you know, there's a section in the Arbitration Act, the 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 uh, to avoid the conflict, uh, um, and they waive that right to uh, allow the mediator to become the arbitrator. There's finality, mm -hmm. subject to appeal. But um, you know, I was thinking as we were preparing tonight, you may have heard. The Superior Court of Justice is not the Ontario Court of Justice, but the Superior Court of Justice just started a pilot project, and you may have heard of this, where judges are going to be judicial uh, pretrials, and uh, you're going to go into those conferences, judicial conferences, uh, on consent, and you're going to, and there's issues there with ILA, independent legal advice, etc. But they're going to make people are going to ask judges to make the decision right there and then. And yeah, which was a is different than the settlement conference yeah. approach per se, though similar, though it's, I think the intention, which is going to be located, and I think in a few jurisdictions outside Toronto, yes, yeah. that's right. the intention is to try, try to work through the buildup, the backlog of cases to expedite and get more efficient uh, outcomes for the parties who are obviously suffering when they're left in queue and waiting for an indeterminate court date to then figure out, okay, when am I going to get my say? So the, the judge in this case basically hears the stuff and then is given the authority by the parties agreeing to the terms to make the decision there. So somewhat like, I don't know, arbitration. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, 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 the just late, uh, Phil Epstein, I, I always quote this co comedy mate. He, he would say, I'd love mediation arbitration. I love meat arb. I just can't stand the arbs. And uh, and I feel the same way. I can't stand the arbs. I, I just came out of a... What do you mean uh, by that? Sorry. Well, um, I want to see people settle. I don't want to go into having to make decisions for people's lives. I hate making decisions for people's lives. I want people in mediation to come together, we're facilitators and we're saying, you guys, you know, we're not gonna be here. We're gonna walk away and, and you're gonna have to live with this decision. You make the decision. Can we help you as facilitators? 
can we say, okay, hold on, we're going to just, maybe this is not, maybe this is another way, you know, we're facilitators to try to bring that together. But uh, when, it, when you get into arbitration, you're into a full-blown trial. You're, you have sworn evidence or affirmed evidence, and uh, it, it's, 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 it's taxing. So I was just saying, I finished day seven of um, arbitration. It was a meet arb. It failed the mediation, the arbitration. So we had a seven days of arbitration, and we're going back on Thursday, and I don't even know if we're going to finish on Thursday, by the way, the eighth day. And well, when, when, you, when you say, though, I'm, I'm going to challenge you on some of this stuff because sure. that's what I do. I, I'm just saying, when you say mediation failed, maybe it actually opened up some opportunity for people to bridge things, though they haven't gotten the, the concrete, decisive decision that ultimately would be in their best interest. So at that stage of that, doing that process, and then it transitions to this other process called arbitration, where the quote third person in the room is now the decision making decision maker relative to mediation where it's ownership rests with the parties to create the outcomes on their own. Now it shifts to a process where you're giving as a party ownership for the decision making to come from the third party. You know, it's quasi judicial, very similar to a court process. Absolutely. Well, you know, it's interesting in this seven day, thing we had uh, this uh, seven day arbitration hearing we had, so we had two lawyers and the clients and we had a tax lawyer very competent tax lawyer and an accountant and uh so as we're in i think it was day five i just said you know what you guys hold on a second let's not talk about this let's get off the record and let's talk about this to try to resolve it's a very complicated tax issue with capital gains and all that and uh it took me like hours and hours to understand, <laughs> but I, I think I got it. Um, and so I said, I know that you're gonna jump up and down lawyers, but like I'm asking you, don't jump up and down. I know this is not you know, the way it should be and you can appeal me and everything else. But anyhow, they ended up talking for about two hours and they hashed out the issue. And it looks like that issue has been settled. So, you know, you can't, it's, it's in line with what you're saying within the mediation process, uh, well, it was really actually in the arbitration process, I, we swung back in to the mediation process and, uh, and it worked, you know, it was taking a chance, but it worked. So uh, yeah, you have mm -hmm. to be open to these things, uh, but you're right, I like what you said, I, I agree, um, that going through the process, uh, people open up their minds and begin to, you know, think, hmm, Maybe there's another perspective here. Yeah, and because the absolute of getting a decision in the uh, in the expectation of the manner that you see the parties wanting, it may not be realized, though it may have created a pathway for that to happen in the mediation aspect of the MedArb approach, which will become a little more apparent and hopefully as an outcome as part of the arbitration part of the MedArb process. So how do you, and Laura, here, I'm going back to you, how do you see uh, what's med arb in terms of family matters? What's that? Uh, I, I mean, I agree with Marty. So med arb is a process that includes pretty much both mediation and arbitration. So the idea is that if if there is no resolution of you know some of the issues in the mediation or all of the issues in the mediation, then you move to arbitration and you make a commitment pretty much you can't really get out of it, of, uh, of the agreement that you're making that, you know, the arbitrator will render a decision at the end. So as opposed to mediation where you, if, if, if it doesn't reach a settlement or, or a mutually satisfying outcome, uh, you pretty much are, you know, you're free to go. It's a bit, you're, you're free to terminate it. Um, med arb, mediation arbitration, you pretty much aren't. Right, so the arbitrator can make a decision in your absence. So that's that's an important distinction because uh, uh, it, it, it's sort of like a hammer, and I, I'm not really um, in love with that with that visual and idea and concept. It's sort of like a hammer above the head that if you're not going to resolve these issues in the mediation in a collaborative uh, sort of uh, phase, then 
a stranger, usually, you know, in this one, Marty, <laughs> would make a decision for your family, which um, may not be so appealing in the end, right, to have a, a complete stranger making a decision for your family, but nonetheless, obviously, it happens. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm starting to really, uh, I'm starting to really see the benefits of, uh, of MetaArb in, in some cases, because it really kind of stops the bleeding for some of the parties who are dragged um, by their co-parents um, or the other party in, uh, you know, in, a, in an ongoing sort of game delay posturing, things like that, right? So it could stop that for one party at the very least. So why wouldn't parties then decide, instead of doing MedArb, let's just go to court because, you know, ultimately, if we don't work this out, we're leaving it decision making up to a third party to impose it on us because we can't agree. So that's the same formula that happens in court. Well, going to court has a totally new meaning today. <laughs> We're talking about months. I, 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 there's oh, a yeah. Facebook uh, page, uh, a private fa Facebook page for, for Ontario family law lawyers, and people are throwing out these dates where we're talking about four, five, six months, two years for a trial. It's incredibly bad. Very, it's it was always bad, but it's a thousand times worse right now. And so, um, definitely, uh, if you're looking for an expeditious uh, result, you go with the other. You, you go with uh, um, uh, family dispute resolution. What I what I think is really good is that the parties are directly there when you go to court the parties are beside their lawyers. And a lot of times you can get permission, and especially in a conference, uh, to speak up as a, a client. But it, it, you have firsthand, it's your back. You know, I have this little booklet that I give out to people. And one of the lines I, I have in there is take back your life. And uh, that was an expression I thought about from the women abuse thing where they have the evening thing where they say take back the night. But in this case, it's take back your life. And so I think that family dispute resolution, whether it be mediation, mediation, arbitration, arbitration, or the collaborative process, uh, or co-mediation, it's um, you need to take back your life and you need to be in control. And, and because you're going to be living with it and the mediator, the judge, the arbitrator, they're gone. You're going to have to live with the consequences, the trail behind you. So be with it, be a, a good consumer and, 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 and get in there and, and really know what's going on in your case because decisions are going to be made and, uh, you know, and have to be made, unfortunately, or it, you know, but they do. And, uh, but you should be a part of it, you know, like it's your life. Take back your life. Well, I would see with COVID in the court and the backlog and all those things that you're talking about from that uh, family lawyers group and the posting of uh, the dating or future trials or court dates, et cetera, so far in the future, I, I would see that as an incentive actually, or a motivation for these lawyers to say, let's try and collaborate, work together, negotiate with the other perspective. Well, there's a lot of, you know, uh, my former law clerk, I got her a job with a, with a lady that does litigation and very media lawyer. And she actually has been referring people to me and she, but, they, they, she says, you've got so much court cases that no one's interested in mediation because the downside of it is now that you can do everything by Zoom because if all the court cases are, you know, ninety percent of the court cases are being done by Zoom, you don't have to leave your office. It's great, and you have this new case lines that have come out. I don't know if you've heard of it, but where you file material um, um, online, everything's done online. You don't have to leave the comforts of your home or your office. It's been kind of a detriment to family dispute resolution, unfortunately. Um, well, I, yeah, though, you know, with the changes with the legislation as of March 1st with Divorce Act and then the respective family law acts of provincially, and there's intention in there with the language to encourage the shifting of process to mediation or collaborative approaches. So why are these lawyers not buying into that concept? Because it's not really, they didn't go far enough, I think, in the wording of the act. I know when you had that Divorce Act uh, uh, section, a uh, uh, segment 
and that's one of the things I wanted to say, and is that, uh, and I was speaking to a friend of mine who's a superior court judge, and the question I asked him is, will they be able to under, will the judges under the new legislation, the new divorce act, which has been pretty well copied, oh, the name is different, they, they don't call it family dispute resolution in the provincial legislation, they call it alternate dispute resolution, but uh, interesting. Um, but uh, they, he doesn't think that they're gonna have the jurisdiction and it won't stand up to force people into, it, the legislation as it is will not allow judges to force people in, although a lot of judges do it. Well, I mean, that, that's part of the issue for me is that, you know, there is the opportunity and in some way it's encouraged within the court process to settle at every point of the journey. You can create consent to an order. You can create minutes of settlement. You guys try and work it out rather than give the decision to me and I might not make the decision as to what you think is appropriate. So I think it's really about the stakeholders, especially lawyers, and then thus judges to take ownership that they have that latitude. Why do they have to be compelled through legislation to be forced to do it rather than seeing the uh, opportunity of doing it? Well, I don't, you know, I, I did a, an advanced course in parental coordination in Florida. I happened to got, get invited to a wedding and I found out that in, that in Fort Lauderdale and Orlando, this person who's very well known in Florida as a mediator and an and instructor uh, had his course. I found it by fluke, really. And uh, so I attended. It was a five-day course, very intensive. But down in Florida State, and I know there's many other states that are like this, a judge will look at a case and they'll say, you know what, this is going to a parental coordinator. I'm not going to deal with it here. One of the things I wanted to say, and I'm just off topic in a way, is that lawyers and, and judges are not social workers. And the problem is j judges are making a lot of social work decisions, unfortunately, and without investigation or without any, uh, without any backing. There's a very big danger on that. And I think the nice thing about ordering people to go to a parental coordinator uh, of sorts is to be able to say to somebody, look, you've got to work these things out. I'm going to send you to so-and-so and you're going to work this out. So, um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but there's, there's nothing stopping the system, like i.e. the Ministry of Attorney General, from, from requir requiring judges, like just recently on the federal level, that it's now compulsory for judges to have, quote, training in sexual assault mm. information awareness. Right. Does that go well far enough? Well, probably not for sure, because judges are responsible for creating the content to deliver to themselves, which is problematic, rather than being compelled to get external players to come in and train them. So the messaging will still be limited. Anyways, Laura, what do you want to say? Um, nothing. Yes, you do. <laughs> I can't I can't get back into that into the same I know I know what you're thinking and I know what I know that you know what I'm thinking um, I do think there's a very different agenda uh, there's polar opposite agendas when we have um, lawyers representing um, representing families or supporting families through a separation and divorce um, instead of having you know, a, a forum for the family, such as the mediation forum. And, and the reality is that families do not separate because of legal reasons, but the legal professionals have now claimed divorce as a legal issue. So there is an issue, there's a problem when you have the legal community taking over an experience or an event that does not necessarily have <coughs> A legal background. I keep reading articles about, you know, COVID, increasing divorces, all that stuff. And you know what? Every single time someone is interviewed, it's a lawyer being interviewed. And they're talking about how 
poor people, poor families are being affected. Domestic violence is increasing. You know, it must be so hard and so tense on psychological, emotional, in, you know, in the households. And that's why, and therefore, and this is the cause. And it's never anyone but a lawyer who is being interviewed and who has, so this is the problem that I've always had, and you know that, that they are claiming a, an, a, an experience, an event that has nothing to do with the legal. It does increase the conflict. The conflict make, makes money. Drama makes money. So, I mean, why stop that wheel? Yeah, they could still, as you say, they'll, they'll get less money to bill or, or uh, hours to bill and less compensation for the hours. Though on the bigger picture, is it's an investment because in collaborative, if you can get people to actually get their cases done, the word of mouth and the opportunity that that creates will actually generate, from my view, more files to Absolutely. then navigate. Absolutely, which will then, my car. And it'll totally compensate for any potential loss of the loss of billable hours. Absolutely. That's, well, that, yeah. It's interesting because when uh, Laura, uh, Laura's cases with Eva don't have lawyers, her cases with me all have lawyers. And we have to have council meetings and all sorts of things. What, what does that say about you, Marty? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I should say, by the way, just so we know, and, and, and I could say literally for the record, because it's being recorded, uh, as of the November 1st, I'm still a licensee. I'm a member of the Lost Side of Ontario, but I'm technically not allowed to give legal advice. So can I call myself a lawyer? I, they can never answer me one way or another. But yes, I'm a member, uh, but I had to pay very reduced rates, fees and all that. So, um, Well, I can't speak for the Law Society. I would say that you're still a lawyer. You can just qualify it that you're not a, quote, licensed lawyer in the sense that you can give advice. Right. You're still a yeah. trained, educated professional with many years of experience. And so that recognition, I think, needs not be lost to yeah. acknowledge who you are it's and sometimes it's good to have lawyers involved i mean really L laura wouldn't you say like it's no absolutely uh, absolutely and it, it's the the right type of lawyers because you know i i don't want to sound anti we actually we we've been we've had the privilege of working with some really nice good lawyers who's their interests, are, who's their, their, their clients' interests, you can tell they're at heart, that they manage their clients, they manage their clients well, their expectations, they move them through, they work collaboratively with the other and with us as mediators or mediators, arbitrators. So there's, there, there is still that, uh, th that pool. However, you know, the traditional lawyer is not really, uh, it hasn't been trained that way. Um, and I think it's very difficult to switch that or to apply, you know, I'm surprised that Marty is uh, applying this lens now after many years in law and litigation and now, you know, with just shifting to mediation, it's not an easy shift. It's not an easy shift to start applying a completely different lens. Um, and I see that he is and he's doing, you're doing a pretty good job, Marty, if I can say so myself. Well, I, you, know, I, you know, my experience too, I, I did a training for a retired Superior Court judge from civil after 30 some years of doing settlement conferences where he's basically telling the parties, this is, if this went to trial, this is what I would decide. Mm -hmm. And that mind, mindset was so approached. So he was looking to transition because he was compelled to retire at age 75. Mm -hmm. And he still wanted to be active because <clears> his <throat> mind was still there. And he wanted to transition to mediation. And so the idea was that uh, get some training in mediation. So I did it with him and uh, a lawyer friend of his who also does bankruptcies and that. And um, the thing is, his transition wasn't so smooth because he had been so ingrained with this mindset. And also, the dilemma for him was that the expectation when he was doing these civil cases of mediation, that the lawyers involved, because that's, they're involved there as well, they were expecting him, they call him judge, and they say, what would you decide on this? Mm. So he was still compelled. He couldn't take himself, even if he wanted to, out of the role of, quote, the neutral, the impartial. He was expected. So there was this whole difficulty for him. Let me ask this 
deeper question. So we have this belief in mediation that a mediator acts only as a mediator when doing mediation. Even if they have another profession, such as being a lawyer, then they cannot act as a, law, as a lawyer in the process of mediation. So why is this able to happen in mediation arbitration? Then when a mediator switches their role and the manner of the process where the participants initially have ownership of their decision-making to the process of arbitration where the third person, the, arbit the mediator was, now is the arbitrator, now has the decision-making authority, thus taking the power out from the parties. Why, why, you know, we tell parties, we tell, you know, if you're doing co-mediation, mm. like you'll know this, Laura, with your colleague, Eva, mm. she's another profession. When she's a mediator, she's acting as a mediator, not mm. in her other profession. And so why in med arb can you actually be both? Mm. Marty? Um, well, people, again, I said, you know, before people want finality, um, I, I, I think that, um, first of all, you, you have to understand that when you do mediation arbitration, you commit yourself to the entire process before. So if it settles in mediation, great. But if it doesn't, you can't pull out and say, you know what, I don't like this mediator. Or, uh, you know, or, I mean, if you don't like the media and you find the person's biased and there have been many cases like that, you can obviously apply the court to have the person removed. But um, um, I think the ha I think that I think uh, uh, what Laura was saying about the hammer over the head is very important. Um, I think it's very important that uh, in certain cases when you have um, uh, your partner, whatever that person may be, uh, is, a, is a bit of a jerk and they're not going to make decisions and they're going to be, they're going to stand in the way. I think you need that. I think you need the hammer over the head. And there are cases where you really do need that. Otherwise, like I'm struggling right now. These guys want me to, one lawyer wants to do mediation. The other wants to do meet art. And I, I'm just saying, I think you're going to waste your money doing mediation because it's not going to happen. So the bottom line is, yes, it is a conflict of, of interest in as much as this. How, that's my next question, because to say, how is this not a conflict of interest when we, you know, as instructors, as coaches, as practitioners, we say, yeah, we have this other profession, though in this role as a mediator, we're functioning solely as a mediator. Then there's sort of like latitude provided or a space to say, no, don't believe me in that. Now it's different. So what's the option? A five-day trial? A ten-day trial? Working I mean, through it in mediation because there's some of us who actually uh, celebrate the opportunity working with people in a deeper way to try to get them out from that depth to get the realization that you know they can get the the outcomes they want. So I, my history is working with intransigent situations through mediation. Well, I must attract the jerks of the world. Because most of the cases, we're not making judgments. No, that's not that you know. A lot of them are jerks on the other side, and I hate to say it. And you try to reason with them, and you'll say, you know, you'll caucus with them, and you'll say, listen, I'm telling you, this is, you know, this is don't do it this way. Like compromise. You know, I, I'm I'm trying to convince them, but you can't do it. So, you know, it just depends on the case. But I, I understand what you're saying. I think people want finality. I think people are, see, most of the cases that are coming to me personally are already set for trial. And they're saying, like, their lawyers are saying to them, uh, mm, $60,000, please. Uh, now, this is unusual. I did this long arbitration, and I tried to dissuade them from doing it and to settle, but it, it didn't happen, unfortunately. Everyone tried. But the point is, is that... Uh, People can't afford it. And generally speaking, you can probably get through an arbitration in about two days. If yeah, it's yeah, but the thing is, I know you keep mentioning about the finality, and I know the intention and your interest with that. At the same time, you also mentioned early on in this conversation that people can actually appeal arbitration awards or decisions, whereas they can't appeal mediation discussions yeah. and decisions. Right, and it, but it's very difficult to do. It's really difficult to, uh, you know, um, 
overturn we'll overturn a decision or award yeah so there's a question from the or a comment and question from the crowd speaking of training for those looking for mediators arbitrators to assist them how can service users know if a professional has done their own work of self-reflection to understand their own triggers biases etc how do each of you want to respond to that it's it's a very tough one. Usually, when when families do enter a mediation arbitration, just like Marty is saying, they do have lawyers. So there are there there is a selection process. There are sometimes there is a selection process where, um, you know, families each family each participant uh, you know uh, puts puts forward three names, uh, then the other puts forward the other three names, and you know there's a sort of almost like a cons consult or interview sort of process. So you call, you call, you know, in this case, Marty, or you call me, or you call someone else, you, all the other media, you get a sense. Um, I always, always encourage families to don't stop at the first call. Even though I've had families, I have, I've had first calls who say, no, 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 we're coming with you. There's absolutely no question about it. And my immediate reaction and response is, I want you to call around. I want you to do your research. I'm going to share an email with you that has all the details about the mediation process, about the structure, about everything like that. But I want you to call around because I want them to have ownership of, in, of, of wanting to start the process as well, not just me pulling them in. Because if if I start that way, then I create almost a quasi precedent that I'm going to work harder than them, or I could potentially work harder than them. And that's not my role. My role is to create a safe space <coughs> where they can work really hard to themselves. So that's why I want them from the onset to make sure they do their research, they, they exercise due diligence when they are looking for options out there, ask the right questions. I even prep them with what questions to ask for their, you know, next, you know, couple of other mediators, you know, ask them if they do this, if they do that, you know, how do they structure the process. Now, and then when you start a mediation or mediation arbitration, you always are, before you sign an agreement, so before you enter into an agreement, you always have to do a one-on-one -on -one intake. And that also is your opportunity to not only build, build rapport, but also ask questions of that particular professionals of the MedR mediator or the mediator arbitrator. And you know what, if you're not satisfied with the questions or if you don't align well, if you don't connect, then I strongly suggest you, you say next, right? I mean, you, you get out of it, sorry. I mean, I know Marty, um, I'm not sure how you feel about that, but I'm very, um, I'm, I've always been very particular about families knowing that they can choose their own mediators. This is why I've had an issue with the rosters across <coughs> know the courts because they just the, uh, a mediation comes in and uh, you know a random mediator joe is assigned to your case and you've never even had the opportunity that parent never even had that part the opportunity to chat to select i mean that the selection itself is it's it's a huge process it's a huge it's it's a huge sort of step before entering the process because it's your process you have to feel comfortable once you feel comfortable you work well right? Moving through. So just to say, my experience as a case manager with community mediation, when we got contacts and then we got, did cold calls and we got parties to say, yes, they're agreeable because it was voluntary. It was my responsibility to identify who to assign on the case based on a whole range of different criteria and factors. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't just a random thing, though I know many programs just do random. It's the next up. Yes. So having a pers purposeful and intentional process of trying to find the best people in the best way to support the, these people going through their struggles, that's, I think that should be a value and an intention as part of a, a delivering uh, of service, especially we did the co-mediation model. And so you had to find, quote, the mediators would fit for the parties and the situation who would fit for each other to help collaborate and support there too. Marty, what do you want to respond? Um, it, it's um, kind of lost my thoughts here. Um, you want to provoke him, uh, Laura? I always oh, do. No, yeah, give, pr prompt him here. Prompt me. 
the, the selection process. So, so yes. okay, going, yes, I got it. I got it. Going back to Stephanie's question, which I think it's a really good question because yeah. mo lots of families don't know they can actually ask these questions. The so yeah. So what happens is when people come here. here this is what I want to say. It, when people come, usually to ask about uh, mediation, it's a lot of times, at least with me, is they go to their lawyers. Their lawyers look for the mediators, and so if they like you know, Michael so-and-so, uh, you know, or Aaron so-and-so, you know, the, the names are out there and, uh, or Phil used to be, you know, and uh, depending on what the, the price range is, you know, oh yeah, I work well with this person. They're really great. Well, why don't you try so-and-so? Oh, well, I don't know. So it's not even up to the clients. Uh, now, if they call fresh, then it's a different story. So I normally, I give them a little booklet and my CVs in there and all that, but there's nothing to say and to answer um, um, uh, the, the, the question there um, from Stephanie is that um, there's nothing to stop you from um, actually calling the person if you're not going through a lawyer, because you'll, if you go through a lawyer, the lawyer is going to want to work with somebody they've already had good experience with. Yeah, there's two things I'll say to that. One is that parties may not feel that they can do that, that they're allowed to do that. And the other is that the lawyer may act as a screen or a filter as, as a gatekeeper to the access to that opportunity to ask those type of questions. Yeah, so I've had a lot, no, I've, I've had people call uh, just to talk, uh, uh, not so much about specifics about the case. Laura and I had a lady, we spent, my gosh, Mrs. Sinton, almost an hour on the, on a zoom call with her because they, the lawyer wanted a, par a parental coordinator and we were going to thinking of taking it on as kind of an, ex well, I wouldn't say experiment, but a new venture and, and doing co mediation in parental coordination. And we spent a cl close to an hour and we did quite well with her. She was a school teacher and everything else. And then that was it. She never retained us. The lawyer actually apologized. I don't think he, I told uh, Laura this, but he apologized because he knew that we had spent a lot of time together with this lady. But there's nothing to stop you. A lot of lawyers may not want to do it, but you know, or a lot of mediators may not. But a lot of people will. And they'll say, "Look, and I, if you, uh, you know, I, uh, yeah, sure." I mean, the the bottom line is you're entrusting your life, your children, your fortune, your family, your relatives. I mean, everything into this one person. Really, I mean, this is the end of the line unless you go to, you know, go to court. So you you want to be able to jive with that person. You don't have that opportunity to do it with a judge. If you don't like Judge Joe, uh, and and that person makes that decision, well, six months down the line, if it, it isn't the case management judge where there's one judge appointed for the whole case, you can still end up with that same person. If they made a lousy decision, you're still stuck with that person. So what I'm trying to say here is that call the person stephanie and shop around be a good consumer and uh you know and feel out the person you know have questions about what do you think about this and have you ever worked on as people say have you ever worked with women abuse cases you know uh or, or abuse, family abuse cases have you ever done that uh and that's important to people they want sensitivity there so um i, I think it goes back to whether, quote, parties or clients believe they have the right, whether they have the opportunity to actually ask those more provocative questions instead of just following and just tell me, Mr. Mediator or Mrs. Mediator, what it is you do, rather than saying, that's the what. Ask more deeper questions about how do you do it? How does that happen? How do you create that? People can. I mean, this is one of the things that working in uh, coaching yeah. at, a, at a particular school in Toronto, that uh, many of the students who were starting as uh, whether they were with the certificate program in dispute resolution or the family mediation, they have all these thoughts in their heads and they're saying, as a mediator, can I actually ask that? And I say, yes, you can, for sure. You can challenge, you can provoke. It's more relative to how you do it, your skill set and how you frame that and your manner and how you frame your question, rather than just saying, can I ask those type of provocative questions? Yeah, 
we can. Well, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Klein, uh, you've been through uh, two divorces and uh, hmm, do you, I gather you uh, don't like women or uh, you don't get along with people or... Uh, what are you, you reciting right now? Somebody said something <laughs> to you? No, I'm just saying here's one of the questions that comes, you know? Yeah, so you, you know, that's one of the skills too uh, that I encourage that us mediators equip ourselves with an inventory of information and knowledge that we can then draw upon to be able to respond rather than react that helps contribute to the questions need to be answered and will fulfill in some way some insight for the person asking the question. So what do you want people to, oh, go ahead, Laura, I see you're there's a, just a trigger. I know I'm going to leave it with that. I know that I know we're close now. I'm mindful of the time. Um, what I have learned in um, in the mediation school, um, I I don't think I've applied <laughs> much. And I think you know, in fact, I have when I have gone the opposite um, because it's uh, it's much more different than when you are in school and um, you can certainly ask any question that pops into your mind and I agree with you Greg very much is how you ask it it's always a deliverance and you can always say something to a party or to a, to a participant it's how you deliver that that information to uh, to that participant right I mean we never want to and I have a hard time still today with words like should you should do this, or I, 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 I believe you really are going to benefit from this. I find saying the same thing, but saying it, other families have really benefited from this, or other families have seen that this particular option worked better than the other, you know, no pressure, just putting it out there for you. But I'm saying the same exact thing, but it's not really, the words are very, very important. And in, mm -hmm. In, in mediation school, I, I didn't really learn that. I learned actually the opposite. I've had quite a few uh, actually lawyer uh, instructors who used way too much the word should and the word advice and the word, you know, legal terminology that has nothing to do in a human interaction. In, so in a relational context not yeah. at all not at all in, in fact in fact the opposite is uh, the opposite is true so it's it's you you do find your style and you navigate but never fear never fear never feel afraid to ask and I, I celebrate that you've created your own autonomy your own independence with regard to how you've taken the information that you were uh, taught we'll call it in the formal context of school because they generally want to play it safe there not rock the boat. And so if you didn't get that kind of appreciation, and then you have the power of your own self-determination to make sense of it, to say what I do know relative to what I actually want to do. And so the should stuff, I will say, should go in the garbage. Should go in the garbage. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so I, I know, you know, Stephanie's out there and I'm not calling you out. Too and late. I, well, I am, yeah. You should and, not and call her out. <laughs> there's actually two Stephanies in the room, so no okay. one knows which one it is. <laughs> Anyways, Stephanie knows, doing her recent training, that I'm, I'm really encouraging her to challenge and be provocative too. And that will help her grow and develop, go deeper within. So uh, what do you guys each want to have... Uh, our viewers, our listeners, take from our conversation. Marty? Um, just be, you know, again, going back to that thing about taking back your life, this is your life. Don't let other people control it, whether it's a mediator, an arbitrator, a lawyer, or a judge. Uh, these are very important decisions that you're making that are going to affect you for many years to come. And uh, be careful and, and, you know, ask other people too. That's the other thing we didn't mention is you could ask people if the experiences they've had with other lawyers or, or mediators, uh, you know, that, that's a good idea. If you want to 
buy a car, for example, you might say to somebody, hey, do you like uh, this kind of model or whatever? You know, so I think you're, um, I think you should be a wise consumer. I hate to say it that way. It sounds very commercial, but, uh, you know, you've got to take back your life before you turn it over to some lawyer who's going to tell you what to do because they ain't going to be around. You know, they're going to do their job. They're paid, you know, plumbers. They're fixing the leak and they'll get the leak fixed and, and get you ready to go. And then they're gone and you're going to have to live with the fallout. And it's not always bad, that fallout. Don't get me wrong. Fallout is a bad connotation. But, uh, you know, a lot of people are very happy with the results of, of the legal system. You know, that's another option that's out there if need be. But, uh, but be wise in, in, in making your choices in, in, in what, what you want to cho choose. And you'll know, you know, if you have a partner that's really recalcitrant, is really stubborn and everything else, and you've been at it for about six, seven, eight, nine months, you know, you may want to do, have the hammer. You may need that hammer. And I think it, that option is there, and uh, I think you should take it. Um, but uh, if you can do the mediation thing alone, it's all the better for certain. Laura, Laura, what do you want? Thank you, Marty. What do you want to share as uh, we close out very soon? Um, I, I, I'm happy that there are options out there, and I'm starting to actually do get uh, more. Um, aligned sometimes and more the the med arb initially originally did not appeal to me but uh, i think it matters who the med arb is and there are options to structure the med arb in a way that it's not going to necessarily feel um you know that there is a, such a conflict of interest if you have for example of co-mediation process right so where you have um, when you have a team like approach and you have it's there's a lot more to talk about the co-mediation how it can be applied to not just the mediation but also the med arb right and how you structure it in a way that it may lessen and it may decrease the the appearance of conflict of interest or it may increase actually the rapport because sometimes you know it, sometimes some some families or some parties do not connect with me but they connect well with marty or they connect well with eva and you know we uh, we, we got it covered for, you know, uh, for lack of better words, in, in terms of uh, having, uh, you know, uh, continuing to work with the family, uh, but still having, uh, having the, the rapport built. Uh, so it's, uh, it's kind of interesting. It's interesting to see because I can see how soul mediators are struggling. I feel very privileged, actually, not to have not to be a soul mediator. Then when I transition into co is is kind of cool it's kind of cool because you get so much more it's so rich right so you get all of those backgrounds and the professional the different perspectives and the debrief and you know kind of the emotional sharing you're not you're not burdening just you know on the burden is not only on your shoulder so there's a lot more richness to it and more uh, um a more relief uh when you when you work with such emotions such such emotions right high emotions yeah, and the expectation is that as co-mediators, you're not to be clones of each other. You're actually to exercise oh, your, your autonomy as individuals. <laughs> We're certainly not clones of each other. And oftentimes I do share with, with, with parents that, you know, I, I say sometimes in joke and jokingly, but not that, you know, perhaps you will see that Marty or I or, or, or Eva and I will... Uh, will actually have such different views on, a, on an issue that, and you will see us model conflict resolution for you. So that's a perk. <laughs> Which is actually a great opportunity to mirror, to help present to people who are actually going through a real conflict, mm -hmm. to say, you can have your differences and they don't have to be a barrier. You can work through them to create opportunity through your co-mediation model regardless of having these differences, right. that they're actually an opportunity rather than a barrier. Yeah, for sure. We have uh, one comment there sh from the crowd. Should, woulda, coulda, all no, no. I'm grateful for the reminders. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you as we really have to, you know, we can stay all night, but I'm sure the crowd in the uh, bleacher seats want to do something else. Um, Anything imparting for tonight, Marty? We can have another future go at some other area of focus. 
No, I just think, uh, you know, like we're all humans. And uh, like we're all going through struggles in life, whatever they may be. And uh, I think that uh, we have to, all of us, especially in this day and age, and uh, this world that's just upside down, uh, have to realize um, there's, a, 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 there's an old French uh, playwright, Moliere, and uh, he said, let us be a little more tolerant to human nature. So those are the words I end with tonight. We have to be more tolerant to human nature and less judgmental and, uh, and realize there's always two sides to the story. There's always, sometimes there's five. <laughs> so uh, uh, being more lenient uh, for, to human nature. Thank you. Laura, anything you want to say in party? I, I, can't, I can't beat that. I can't no. beat Moliere, that's for sure. No. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have a Laura-ism? <laughs> I don't. I'll, 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 I'll get one for next time. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you, Greg, uh, for, for or, organizing this, as always. Um, and Marty, thanks for, uh, thanks for uh, showing up for this. <laughs> yeah, and now you can go to the beach and get the cooled off. Now you can jump in the pool. Yes, thanks for coming out of the pool for us. <laughs> <laughs> he might have his swim shorts on right now. Just gonna. <laughs> Don't get up. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, he's got his shorts on for sure. Yeah, just keep it there. <laughs> this is. Uh... Anyways, thanks very much for everyone. And uh, we'll see you next week and uh, another provocative conversation. So thanks, Laura, for your technical assistance along with Anthony. Pleasure. <laughs> and we'll see everybody else. All right. Do your thing. Thank All you right. Bye. Good Have night. a good night. Bye-bye.